Do not confuse this with treatment or mental health advice or direction. Nothing on this podcast is made to supplement or supersede the relationship and direction of your mental health caretakers. Although David Kozlowski is a licensed marriage and family therapist, he is not functioning as a certified mental health professional in this environment. But same applies to any professionals who may appear on the Light the Fight podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to Light the Fight. I'm David. Hey there, I'm Heidi. <laughs> that coming a little too, a little too I, hot for you, a little yeah, too that, intense? You know, I didn't know you were going to give me that much energy. You didn't have that much energy just a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, well, because I'm faking <laughs> the energy. He's bringing it. He's bringing it. Faking the energy. <laughs> and I didn't start out with anything sarcastic, so you're probably wondering, where's uh, what's going the on bad here? sense of humor? <laughs> no bad sense of humor yet. But welcome to Light the Fight. Thanks for visiting and thanks for making us a part of your chores, your driving, Laundry. whatever you're doing right now. Laundry. Um, as always, at Light the Fight, we like to give our gratitude and our appreciation to all of our loyal listeners. And many of you have come out to our events in the past month. So we did an event in Heber. I uh, did an event last night in middle school here in um, uh, Harriman Daybreak area. And uh, every time we do these events, oh, TED Talk on Saturday, it's great to have our listeners come out and Swiss Days. Oh, you know, man. Which was uh, quite the light the fight event. Even I, though it wasn't I, told, <laughs> I told David he needed to be there because it was really, Swiss Days was really just a light the fight open house. I, you know what I could have done? I could have said, I'll give you 15 minutes of free therapy if you purchase over $50 of See? Pine Swap Pride. See, you would have you you helped me out. But then I would have asked Although for a percentage. Although we would have had a real backup. Yeah, I would have went for a percentage and you would have, <laughs> like, wait a second, buddy, you make this stuff. What's happening here? Yeah. No, so thank you for everyone that's come out to our events. Thanks for sharing your input. Thanks for your questions. And today's a day where, you know, we're going to give you caught up to speed about what we've been up to this past week and- Jump into some questions. We've gotten some great questions f from, you know, weeks back from Heber. But last night we got some great questions from middle school. So we're going to do some rapid fire answering of the questions. So instead of me going on in long depth about one question, we're going to try to hit about, you know, six or eight questions, maybe even more if we can get through them pretty quickly. Awesome. That yeah. sounds yeah. great. Um, and first off, we want to give a big shout out and thank you to our uh, community sponsor, 1-800-CONTACTS. For just always having our back and giving us uh, this platform and putting us out there in the community and being supportive to certain people who don't have the ability to get some of the resources from Light the Fight. 1-800 is always willing to come in and help you parents and your families out there to get our information. And also, they make pretty dope contacts. So it's I'm fortunate stuff. enough that I don't need 1-800 contacts, <laughs> but if I did need them- Do you have perfect vision? That Yeah. That's one of the two things I have that are- <laughs> Well, there or the you way go. they're supposed to be. You got to have something. You got to have something. That's my thing, perfect vision. <laughs> there you go. My wife's like, why did you not see that light post before you backed up into it? Tell my wife, under five miles an hour, I'm a serious risk for a car accident. <laughs> Over five miles an hour, I never You're get in a good. car accident. I'm just bad at backing up. Even the backup cameras don't slap me and say, hey, dude, watch out. Like I need them to assault me oh, for man. me to realize that I'm about oh, to hit something. Oh, man. So, uh, and also thank you to our other sponsor, teencounseling.com. We talk about it all the time, but it bears repeating. So here's how it works. You get to teencounseling.com. You put backslash LTF and that's short for like the, the fight. fight. As Heidi just found out last episode. <laughs> how do they do that? They just, just like to make sure there. you guys. Yeah. And uh, go there. If you've been looking for a counselor for your teen from 13 to 19 years old, go to teencounseling.com backslash like the fight and here's how it works. You get signed up, they match you up with a therapist, they see what your needs are, they see what the needs of your child is, and they match you up with a therapist, not necessarily just the therapist that's close to you because it's through online, they can match you up with a therapist that's best for you. And if there are some changes that need to be made and something doesn't work out with the relationship or the connection with the therapist, they can quickly find you a new therapist. The process ha starts happening within 24 hours. And on top of that, you get a 10% discount from being a Light the Fight listener. And on top of that, it allows your teenagers to use their phone. And let me tell you guys something. If you didn't know this, your teenagers are comfortable using a cell phone. 
I think that they, they know that. They feel safe. I, so think, I think the parents out there know that. <laughs> if you take your kid's cell phone and put it next to them, you can call that a safe space. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Hello. Because <laughs> no one will say, no, get that phone away from me. I don't feel safe around it. They'll say, bring it hither. Yes, they will. So that's a safe space. If you ever want your teenager to feel safe, just put their cell phone near them. Or a brand new cell phone works even better. And actually, they feel really safe around a brand it's, new it's cell not, phone. It's not super safe in all situations, right? So There's joking in so, what I'm saying. <laughs> but back no, to life, back, back so, to teen so counseling. So that is... That is a specifically. Back to teencounseling.com, all joking aside, it's a big deal. There's no hoops to jump through, like coming to my office, waiting in the lobby. Your teen gets to control, meaning when I get to control, they get to have some control and feel like they're a part of the counseling experience. And all too often, that's not how counseling starts off. If you have a good counselor, they can make them feel comfortable. But starting out counseling, FaceTiming, we just call it FaceTime, it's through their app, but it's similar to FaceTime. Texting, phone calls, it allows you to have the access, the, a therapist to have access to your teen and the influence over your teen, but they can get to them much easier. You don't have to jump through those hoops. So teencounseling.com backslash light the fight. So let's get to, well, let's do a little update. So I did this thing this past weekend. Let's get a little, let's, let's hear about it. I gave a Matt Ed talk. <laughs> Ted, Ted X, oh, you guys. Oh, Ted X, not guys, Matt Ed. Okay, it, it's been, that. it's, uh, it's been like what? Four didn't days. They already forgot. <laughs> didn't get a lot of sleep. Just coming out of the vulnerability hangover. You guys, no. David did so awesome. I was super, I was super proud of you. I wish I could have like. Stood around and taking credit for how great you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you. And it means a lot because, you know, as you know, I took it serious. I, well, I, yeah, I to, I'd say. I, <laughs> 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 maybe a little too serious. I, don't, I know. don't think you can take those people, those TEDx people. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't take it as serious. No, you did as not anyone. take it too seriously. That's for sure. I took it as serious as I had to take it without going crazy and like ruining my own personal life. I felt I took it good serious. <laughs> Definitely didn't take it as serious as the people putting on the event because that's their thing and that's what they okay, do. Okay, so and we're getting tons of questions about how people can watch. Yes. So quick little, um, if you want to see the TED Talk, they're telling me to expect it six weeks after the event. Looking at last year, it came out two or three months after the event. I'm hoping, I'm telling everybody six to eight weeks. Realistically, six to eight weeks. That's when it'll be released on YouTube. I will have the information. We'll, I'll let you guys know when it comes out. And if it's uh, worth sharing, I, I really, I'm planning our listeners at least give it a shot and listen to it. For it's sure. only eight or nine minutes, so it's not going to be too much investment time. But if you like it, maybe share it. I don't know. It's a thought, right? <laughs> ideas, thought. ideas worth sharing. Ideas worth sharing. And with that, um, they'll also be able to get some of the parenting partnerships. So that's what I did my talk on the parenting partnership here locally. We have some dates that we'll be posting, and I think we have posted a couple yes. of them. Yes, in fact, let me just yeah. bring that up again. And those um, dates are where if you're here local, you can come to a free uh, community event put on uh, Jordan School District, uh, sponsored by Harriman High School, where you can learn about how to do the parenting partnership. So, and we've kind Harriman. of talked about this. Um, so it's October 29th and November 5th, which is two consecutive Tuesdays. So two Tuesday nights. And so your plan, and we've kind of talked about this, so it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Um, on the t on the night of the 29th, you're kind of helping people understand it, set one up. Yeah, so the first night I'm teaching the concept how it works. Then they're going to go home, they're going to do an assignment, and they're going to come back the next Tuesday night. Because the ones who are serious – they're going to need a little bit more insight to this. Uh, for sure. Then they come back on the second night. Then I answer the questions. I fill the information. And by that time, and by when the time the TED Talk comes out, I will have a, a very short, very simple, detailed download and e-course available um, that you can purchase. That's going to – the people that ha – maybe have more of a challenging challenging situation, might need a little bit more of that help. And so uh, that'll be available as well. So you can get the free stuff. You can watch, if you just watch the TED Talk and you figure it out on your own, great. If you want to come to the free one, if you want to download the e-course, we're just going to make it so that one very small specific thing to give you and your teens or you and your kids, it doesn't have to be with teens, but you and your teens or kids, uh, something to work on your relationship with is going to be a game changer. Trust me. So if you're wondering, like, what the heck are you talking about? We have talked about it a couple times here on the podcast. So in episode number 50, 
and episode number 62, David kind of talks about the parent-teen partnership. Um, So again, it's 50 and 62. And you you guys know I'm a a slow learner. It's really hard for me. Um, Actually, the most insightful episode about the parent-teen partnership was not on our podcast. It was actually on the Still Trippin' podcast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to tell them about that one. If you don't know, David um, has another podcast that he usually records right before we start Like the Fight. You might not know because I never advertise it anywhere, so continue. (laughs) Right. You (laughs) got to keep a secret. You got to be on the inside track to to learn about it. But it's called Still Trippin'. And... um, on episode number five, I'm just double checking it. It's oh, episode number six. The title is September. And September is an individual, it's a girl, who went through this process with her parents. Um, it's really interesting to hear her say it, to hear her talk about it. And to hear her talk about how it empowered her. And I, I get chills thinking about it because it it was a it was such a, game a success changer. story for her. It it's was a ridiculous. game changer yeah. for her. And if you like she's going to college I happen now. To she's know, got a job. Like, there's I happen so to much know going September. <laughs> and she is She may or may not have the same last name as you. <laughs> that's right. You guys um so that's a, those are three episodes that are really worth listening to. And then the, the October 29th, November 5th, those are right here at locally. If, if you are local, Harriman High, um, great opportunities. I'm excited to see how that's going to go down because you guys, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's good. Well, listen, it's I, I don't good. get a chance to, to share and to teach. That's a very specific thing to right. parents. And um, the only time I get to do that, and we get to do that, is at our parent teen part, at our parent teen, our parent influencer workshops that we hold. Which well, we gotta, you don't even go into it this kind of detail yeah, in no, that workshop because the, that workshop is a broader approach. But this is one specific thing that once the TED Talk comes out, you'll be hearing a lot more about this because it works. It's new. It's fresh information. I've been doing it for years, but it's new to the public. And I'm really excited about it because you parents out there, you all need something that's going to provide enough struggle for you and your kids to work on something together. But it has to be something that's not so overly painful for them. And it's got to be something that they actually want. Well, turns out your kids want freedom. At the end of the day, they need freedom. They want it before they they even pay for it. And here's what parents need. They need to respect what their kids are doing first. Then if they respect what their kids are doing, then some trust starts to grow. If they continue to do it, the trust grows even more. And then the freedom comes last. Teenagers want the freedom just up front. So the parenting partnership uh, is a little hack and a little way I figured out to give them just enough freedom up front to put a little carrot in front of them. And then you switch it around. And before they know it, they're doing hard work. <laughs> But it's, it's very true. manipulative, it's which why it works. The 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 good manipulation. The good manipulation. That's right. Good, one. not the bad one. <laughs> anyway, so you guys are gonna you guys are gonna love that. You'll hear more about it. Um, and so anyway, I gotta tell you though, real quick, uh, during my talk, um, the reason why I wasn't nervous. I mean, I was. I had a little bit of a rough morning. Had some technical difficulties with the car and stuff kind of freaked no, me out. No, you guys, here's the thing. I was with David. I was, I'm was. i with Brandon at, okay, we're at Kingsbury Hall. First of all, I thought it was a Bravena Hall. So I went They're to the, the complete wrong hall. <laughs> so I get there and Brandon's there and we, we go in and um, David's coach comes up to us and says, are you Heidi and Brandon? And we're like, yeah, what has he been saying about us? You know, <laughs> like we knew that he'd been talking, he, he'd been either talking us up or uh, we're not sure. No, she was super cool, this coach. And She's and awesome. um and then she goes, Well, David had a rough morning. <laughs> and 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 I was like, Oh no. And Brandon goes, Well, for David, if it wouldn't have been a rough morning, he would have been leery. Yeah, something's wrong. That means it's not important. <laughs> right. So David just knows and this is one of the things I've had to learn um about David. 
it doesn't matter if it's a workshop or an event or anything that we do, stuff goes wrong. And, but do um, I freak out? No, because you've learned the stuff's just going to go wrong. And so he, like before our events, he'll be like, do you have this? Do you have this? He'll be like trying to think of everything that's going to go wrong. And he'll like, we'll test stuff out. And then we get there. Doesn't work at all. It just doesn't work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, at least I checked all the boxes. I can't help. Right. I can't help karma or so, bad, you know, bad luck. So when we found out that David had had a rough morning, we didn't know what it was. But me and Brandon like fist bumped. We're like, oh, uh, okay, it's gonna be a good. Gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> like, isn't it that weird thing? Think of you guys. Think of all the big moments of your life and how so many things, just like a domino effect, just fell in not the best direction for you <laughs> right before it happened. But you pulled it off anyways. For me, just that's just par for the course. That just always happens. So now I'm like, if nothing bad happens, maybe it's not even that important. Maybe I shouldn't even be doing this in the first place. Right. Right. So it it was great. And um, so all went according to plan, but I was going to tell you the reason why I wasn't nervous. You guys saw the pictures that we posted of the shoes. Tell you what, man, standing up on stage with those two boys, because I had a rough morning and I keep on, I kept on coming back to, it doesn't matter if I had a rough morning. This isn't about me. This talk is for those people. This talk is to honor these boys, to help their families know that other people are learning from your hurt and pain and also learning from my hurt and pain. Cause I didn't learn this cause I read this. I had to, struggle as a therapist. I had to struggle as a counselor. I had to admit to people, hey, I screwed up. I gave you bad advice last time. But just to stand up on the stage with Corey and, and Cave, you know, on my shoes, it just it just went away. Like there was nothing at that moment that could have made me feel that I wasn't going to do a good job. So yeah, well, just I for, for you and for Cave's family, um, thank you guys just for letting me represent your sons, you know? I felt it too. Um, I was, I was going to try to find it really quick. Maybe I'll have to, I'll have to share it another um, time. Um, got a really great DM today that um, started out, you know, I'm really sorry that you had to lose your son. Um, and then she just went on and on talking about how light the fight. First of all, she said, um, my sister tried to get me to start listening a year ago. And she kind of listed some of the things that were going on with one of her children and things had to get pretty rough. Um, and she finally started to listen, but immediately just like we know, and just like we found, um, these little things started aligning and, and she said, I just need you to know that the difference in our family is, is so huge. And, you know, I just, my my thoughts went to Corey and Kaveh. You know, um, be, because this is the best thing that we can do to honor them. And you stand on that stage with your fancy suit. <laughs> ah, like <it. laughs> Looking fly. <laughs> But hey, I was business you, up top, party in the yeah, bottom of my you, van, so that's right. I kept that's a right. gangster. He did and not. A he did not look like your typical therapist. Well, I didn't even look like me because I, I mean, you only see me in a suit one time, right? Well, that's true. I was like, "Where's the flannel shirt? <laughs> Where's the plaid flannel shirt with the vans?" <laughs> anyway, so those boys were. This is this is that's the absolute best way that you can honor them. And I was standing on shoes with their names on it, but really it's 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 for anyone out there that doesn't want to be forgotten. You know, people want to be remembered. People need to be remembered. Our life experiences that were hurtful and painful, they're in our life at a specific time that it's like a time capsule. And those lessons in life, as painful or as happy as, as sometimes they can be good lessons, sometimes they can be painful lessons, all those things are meant to teach us something, but we can't learn from them if we forget what got us there in the first place. You know, like what got us here to this podcast is your son. What got me here to the position where I had to work on parenting partnerships were, you know, working with people like Kaveh and, and his father and them having to work out their differences. And I'm happy to say that they did work out their differences. Even though Kaveh passed away by suicide, that last month of his life was the best him and his dad had ever been together. He was getting good grades. It just, just to see that the story is not being done told yet. 
it's just, yeah, that was a horrible part of it, what these kids went through, but there's so many other people out there that when they hear information like this and they feel like, wow, my my story or what we went through, you're well representing that. We're feeling like we can learn from that. That's what makes me happy to know that any hurt and pain these people have gone through, you're going to be missing your child. You're going to be in pain. But to see that that pain of yours is somewhat for someone else's benefit, damn, I'd rather take that than just being in pain all day. Mm-hmm. It's true. Um, I wanted to add in that if there's somebody that you keep thinking you would benefit from listening to, right, l- listen to the podcast, listen to the podcast, I will say that um, it's super overwhelming, especially when you're struggling, when you know that your parenting isn't working, when you know that you got a kid that's struggling. Um, when someone says, oh, you should listen to Light the Fight. It's this great podcast. It's kind of like, backing up a you know a dump truck and just like dumping this huge overwhelming pile so if you have if you are wanting to recommend the podcast to somebody that you know is struggling i recommend you say something like you know one thing that i learned on this podcast that i listened to was this And you know what? I'm going to send you a link. Fast forward to minute number 15 and just listen to what they say. And think about a way to be Share the chorus of the song that's going to, the hook, the thing that's going to catch you. (laughs) Because an hour long podcast, listeners ramble and they don't know, may not be the sexiest thing. You guys are starting to get to know us. You're like skipping to 15 anyway. But (laughs) um, it's the words like the fight, the words parenting podcast. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the word. It's it's triggering, and if you're struggling with that, it might be the last thing they you want to listen to, you, you know, because you you don't want to hear all the stuff that you're doing wrong or anyway. So you know, it's for some reason when you're talking, it reminds me of back in the day when I had a lot of debt and bad uh, credit, and I knew I needed help and go see a debt consolidator, but I just kept on putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. My friend's like, I got the best person to help you. No, no, no. And finally, with my tail tucked between my legs and full submission, head hanging low, I went in there and all of a sudden, someone that knew what they were talking about gave me a little bit of hope. And after I got the hope, then they gave me a strategy. Then they even planned. And actually, you know, years later, I'm like, I'm doing much better. Sometimes we have to be in a position where we're just, it's the right timing and the right moment. But I like what you said, Heidi, because if you give just that nugget to your friend, just say, listen, just to that, just this mark to that mark on this one episode, that's like the worm on the end of the hook. You just got to get a little bit of movement, get them to bite that hook a little bit. And then, and then, then it'll so spark some curiosity. Not so scared of it. You know? Yeah, not so scared. And then maybe they'll read some of the books we've talked about. You know, it just, you never know where it can go. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's- That's great advice. That's something, yeah. um, I, I think we all kind of know somebody that we kind of think, can you, could you maybe listen to this? Anyway, okay. So as promised- Okay, we're going to start answering some questions in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, here we go. So, give it to us, Heidi. Okay, here we go. See what you got. How do I rebuild trust with my child that has lied to me repeatedly about big stuff? Well, first off, thanks for the question. That is a hard thing because the big stuff is usually the dun, 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 dun. It's the worst. It's, it's the moments where like, if they are honest to me, maybe I could forgive them of some of their past wrongdoings. And then they lie to you again. Would you take it personal as a parent? You think some parents take that personal? Would you freak out? Would you freak out? Maybe, Maybe. you start thinking about all the things you've done for them. Have since... you freaked out before? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm start... just thinking of myself. <laughs> Maybe you start thinking of all the things you've done for them that week or their whole lifetime. And that makes it really easy to take it personal and be offended by it. I want to I want to just add one little tidbit before David answers the question. Because I started to think... Did you ever lie as a teenager to your parents? Like, oh, if so, no, I, I'm, this is that. kind of just rhetorical. I'm like, I can't remember telling them the truth, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> I got to think about the couple times I told the right? truth. Right. Yeah. So why did you lie? And why did you not tell the whole truth? Why did you avoid conversations? You know, so I just kind of want 
you as a parent to maybe just visit that thought because I had a couple doozies and I still feel the wrath <laughs> of, of those lies. And why, why did I lie as a teenager, you know? And yeah. you, you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want your mom to forget. You don't want to let anybody down. You know, it's, it's a whole myriad of, of things. Um, but anyway, let's, let's hear what David says. How do you rebuild trust? Well, um, and if you're 47, is it too late? <laughs> we're going to try to give some fast, rapid answers. So I'm going to say the answers, but I'm not going to get into as much detail as I did because I want to get through a lot of these questions. Big lies feel like big setbacks. Okay. But by definition, if it's an opportunity for a big setback, it is an opportunity for a change in the guard, a change in the pattern and communication. Usually kids don't want to get in trouble. So that's one of the reasons why they lie. Another reason is they have a certain amount of um, research and uh, uh, development uh, trying to figure out how you're going to handle the truth. And if their research and if their due diligence comes back that you and truth don't usually go well together, <laughs> then they start to taking the pathway. I got to get better at lying or just giving the bare minimum of information. Problem is parents, we sniff that out. We said something's going on. So if your kids are lying to you big time, there's a lot of things at play. They've had some bad experiences that you can't handle it. Then on top of it, they don't want to get in trouble. And on top of that, they're still trying to figure out what the truth really is. They don't know if, if the truth is that they're a person that can admit making mistakes, or they don't know if the truth is they're a person that has to hide the mistakes because they're not good enough for people to like them when they have mistakes or when they've made mistakes. So first thing you want to do, is give your kid every opportunity to change their mind. Give them 24 to 48 hours. So they lie about something big and you're sitting there going, hmm, I found out different. I know this, I know that. Give them 24 hours to change the story. And here's how you can do that. They come to you, they tell you the big lie, you know the truth, maybe you have proof that you haven't shared with them. Instead of putting them on blast, instead of interrogating them, I want you to pretend like you have no information and you have no truth. And you say something like this. Let's say they snuck out the night before. You uh, put up some of those new cameras that just show up on your phone and you didn't tell them about one of the cameras you put up so they didn't know the angle was there. You saw them sneaking out and you're like, they came home like, I was not, uh, I just had to leave. I forgot something in my car that was in the garage. But apparently that set off the alarm to go outside the house even though I was inside the house. This is one I've heard not too long ago. So in that particular situation, they give you all the information, just like we've said plenty of times, and I always say in our past episodes, but give me the benefit of the doubt that you haven't heard of these past episodes or can't remember them right now, when your kids give you lies, when you feel offended, when you feel like you take it personal, I want you to do something different. I want you to play dumb. <laughs> Pretend that you believe the lie. This is literally the hardest thing that I've ever been asked to do because I work to play smart. Like I, so I most really people try think to They're trying pretend, really hard yeah. so that no one can get over them and take yeah. advantage of them. Well, look at my face. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you think someone's lying to you and you caught them lying and you know you're just waiting for them to get done talking, you're like, and your facial expression, like, oh, I know the truth. And as they're lying to you, then it's like, oh my gosh, my parents mad at me. And then your anger at them justifies the reason why they lied because you can't handle the truth. You just can't handle it. So here's what you do instead. When I say play dumb, I want you to play naive, coy. Your body language has to go, huh? So you went out last night to the garage door and it, I tell you what, I, I'm just going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Because by the way, if you start walking down the path and start pulling back all the details they just gave you, you're going to find so many holes in it, so it's going to look like Swiss cheese. You're like, wait a second. What do you mean you didn't do that? What, how did the alarm go off when you just went into the garage? Questions, questions, questions. And said, play dumb. And say, you know what? I'll give you the benefit of the doubt that that's what's happened. However, let's say, you know, sometimes when I'm sleeping at night, I, you know, I don't remember that I got up and ate a half a dozen cookies. I don't know, but the proof's there. The crumbs are all over. It's, the chocolate chips are stuck on, have you ever fallen asleep with the cookie on your chest? Happens to me all the time. <laughs> and you know, the proof's there. You can't, 
but maybe you just don't want to admit that you could have done that, even though you know you did. So you tell your kids, say, however, let's say Ramley, like I do, I eat too much late at night, whatever. Let's say maybe you got the nights confused or maybe there's a mistake or something happened. And if they go, well, no, 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 no I'm just saying, just in case you didn't remember all the details happened last night, we'll talk about it later. I'm giving you the benefit out, but if, let's say you remembered some of the details you forgot about, I'd be happy to hear it. And look at me. Am I freaking out? No. The old me would have said, you snuck out. Let's go look at the videotape. I'm not even going to look at the camera. Oh, by the way, we had a camera outside that can see everything. So if you snuck out or if, if you had to go outside, whatever, to let the dog, it'll show it. No big deal. But I'm going to give you the benefit. I'm not even going to look at the camera. But you're staring at them when you say that. And then you walk away. You know what they do in interrogations, like police departments, FBI, They don't and stuff like give that? them any food or water and they leave them in there all by themselves. <laughs> they just give them time. Yeah. You ever heard of the Chinese water torture? Yeah. Where they just let a drop of water just slowly drop on someone's forehead oh. all day, every day. It would drive people crazy, not to mention put a dent in their forehead but it would drive them insane. Just a tap, tap, tap. Sometimes our kids need to be alone with their own story. Hmm. Do not rob your kids of the opportunity to learn how to tell the truth by providing an environment where it's too dangerous to tell the truth. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Tell them off time. Now let's say 48 hours later, go, hey, that story still working out okay? So yeah, is there anything changing? Oh no, okay. Gosh, you know, because I did get a notification on my phone that same night, an email. I'm thinking I, I maybe should look at the camera, but if there's something you want to tell me, you know, I'll, I'll give you some time. You know, and they know you know, but it's not about you calling them out. It's about them bringing it out. They have to share it with you. So to answer that question, how do you get... How do you trust them again after this? You have to provide an opportunity and set them up to manipulate them to start telling the truth. Manipulation by definition means to tweak or change. You're trying to change their perception of you. So you need them to see you as a person that can handle it, that can play it chill, be like, yeah, they know that you know, but the fact that you're not freaking out on them and calling them out and letting them buy some time, that time it's gonna wear on them and they're like, you know what, if they were gonna freak out, they would have done it already. This drastically increases the probability that you can have a conversation. And then when they admit that they lied, say, tell you what, took you a little bit longer than I thought, but I'm going to reward you for eventually telling me the truth. So maybe there's still a little bit of a consequence, something that's just super slight and soft, but you're not going to go heavy on them because just like in the court system, if you admit that you did something wrong, sometimes it takes off time of you having to be in jail. Or sometimes you don't go in jail at all, but what the judge tells you, so I hear, the judge tells you that, oh wait, I posted I went to jail already? Dang it, I forgot about that <laughs> post. Okay, what had happened? Was <laughs> when you go and you say, I made a mistake, I'll do the community service, I'll do it, I'm not even gonna fight it, I screwed up, I should have you know, should have done my time, should have done it, I apologize. Okay, tell you what, you're not gonna go any jail time, do some community service, do the fines. But these two years you're supposed to do in jail, We'll add them to you again if you have another offense. So hmm. now the second offense, instead of getting, instead of just going to jail, now they're going to go to jail for four years instead of two years. I mean, I forget what they call it, but it's a rough estimate. So I was like, you get a lot of freedom up front. To, they're trying to keep you out of the system. But if now you screw it up after they gave you the solid, now you're going to do the time. So it's that same type of approach. We want to help you succeed. We're, if you as a parent is trying to find their lies, oh, you'll find lies, but then you would have to acknowledge your own if you want to be fair. Let me ask you a question. This isn't on my list, but what if you have a kid that is an exaggerator? So these aren't like blanket lies. This is taking something that happened and and – Leveling it up to the point that maybe you're freaking out as a parent because maybe they want you to freak out. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I've been in those situations as well. 
Pay attention to the meaning, not to the details. Pay attention to the over arc of the story, not the characters of the story. So the, the exaggerations that teenagers come, there's adrenaline from telling a story. There's an adrenaline from telling a story that's a lie because you know you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. And so you get into character. You start, and then they said this, and they said that. It's pretty common and pretty well known that teenagers exaggerate. And sometimes the exaggeration just turns into a flat out lie, but it was a good story. So they went with the story. <laughs> if it's a better story, the truth, they're going to go with the better story than the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times that can happen. So I tell people when you have an over-exaggerator, you entertain the exaggeration. Hmm. <laughs> Instead of trying to call them out and see where they're wrong, say, you know what? So what you're saying is by that happening and then this happened and that kid almost died. Now, chances are it's like, yeah, you heard the real story. Yeah, no one almost died there. There's no gun shooting. You know, like it just kind of was, and then this happened. You go, wow, that's so crazy. Like, wow, you're so lucky to be alive. Yeah, well, you know, it's... You know, it's, it wasn't my life that was in danger, someone else's life in danger. Well, I tell you what, I'm glad you guys had fun last night. Nothing bad happened and walk away. You want to acknowledge it, but you don't want to reward it. Hmm. So how you stop someone from an exaggerating over and over and over again is you tell them, tell me more. Then when they tell you, you tell them you 100% believe you and that's so amazing. And then when you're done with that, you tell them, okay, you're still going to do your chore? Okay, great. Because a lot of it's just a distraction and they're, it's just creating a diversion hmm. to or take the attention off this. Yeah, right. Yeah. So one of our other questions going to come up is much more serious about suicide, but I'll give a very similar response. You want to actually acknowledge the exaggeration. You want to acknowledge the story. And then once you've acknowledged, you've accepted it, you can move them past it. Because it's when they think you don't believe their exaggeration story, that's when they'll go on and on and on. But if you accept that you believe it, then you can get back to the real solution or the problem at hand. Okay, so let me just bring up that question then. It says, if your child threatens suicide, how do you know if it is used to get a reaction from you, force you into coddling, or if it's sincere? If suicide is sincere and your child doesn't want to go to therapy, what should you do? Force them to go or forget about it? So there's a lot of questions yeah, well, in Well, I'm going to answer but... the first one. If your kid is threatening suicide and you don't feel like they're sincere, one, you don't know if they're sincere or not. You, you can speculate, right? I don't think anyone wants to gamble with that though. No. No one I, wants, to, no one wants no. to gamble with that speculation. So you have to take it serious. If they're threatening suicide, the fact that they would use suicide of all things to make their point. Back when I grew up, kids just used the F word every other word. <laughs> It was like a comma. It was like a semicolon. It was like an and, like F this, F that. That's F and cool. That F and sucks. But now it's like that just doesn't, with social media and with all the attention people doesn't get, get the impact. it's like, yeah, you got to really step it up. And unfortunately, some people fall along suicide and see that people have a huge reaction to that and they'll use suicide. Now, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of slang out there like, oh, kill me now or yeah. put a gun to my head or shoot me. Yeah. You, you know, like- There's a difference. Yeah. But I think establishing that we don't joke about suicide, that you want them to talk about it, but not joke about it. Um, anyway, so, so go on. That, that yeah. that's a t that's a, It's a touchy So one. this one will be a lot shorter than the last one. If they're threatening, you take it serious. If they're threatening and they're telling you, hey, I'm feeling suicidal – the last thing you want to do if you feel that it's a false flag, that it's not real, is say, okay, you're feeling suicidal? Well, then we're going to go to the hospital. We're going to go down there right now, and you're going to tell them you're suicidal. Let's go. Let's go. You want? You feel you're suicidal? Let's go to the hospital. Let's go. Let's go. That doesn't sound supportive, and that's not taking it serious. That's saying, I'm calling your bluff. Let's go. I'm, I'm all in. I'm adding in. So instead, you say, thank you for trusting me. Thank you for telling me this. It's got to be very scary for you. I don't, let's say you have no idea what's going on. Whatever's going on, I'm here for you. I support you. Okay. I don't know if you'd feel comfortable talking to me about what's going on. If you did, I'd like to listen. If not, you can talk to mom you can talk to this person, whatever. If they said, no, I just, I just want to die. I can't live this anymore. Like, I don't know. Like, I just keep on thinking about taking pills, whatever it may be. Say, so, okay. Well, I love you. And we're going to get you some help. Well, I don't want to go therapy. I don't want to do this. Oh, no, no. It's, it's totally, I, I totally get it. I totally get it. You talk to them for a little bit. 
buy yourself some time, go off to the side. Here in the state of Utah, you can use the crisis mobile hotline. They can send a social worker, a crisis, well, a crisis treatment worker out to discuss with you the situation. Um, you can put them in the car. You can say, we're going to go for a drive and you can go to your local ER. Every ER has to have, at least on call, usually have them there, a crisis intervention specialist uh, on hand to do assessments to see if this person uh, meets the criteria to go to psychiatric hospital. The only way this works, though, is if you do it with sincerity, kindness, compassion, love, and very la 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 as a matter of fact. If you stay calm and you just take the necessary steps to get them the crisis treatment that they need, that could be calling the suicide hotline, having them speak to someone, going to the ER, or like I said, having the crisis mobile team, if you have a mobile team in your area, you making some sort of action like this is the best move, and here's why. If you tell them to tell you what they need, they're probably gonna tell you some things that they don't want to do, and they're gonna tell you some things that they're willing to do. They may be willing to take their phone back from you if you've taken it from them, but they're not willing to go to therapy. They may be willing to threaten suicide and tell you how horrible a parent you are, but they're not willing to sit and have a conversation about you know their behavior. You don't want to talk about the problems in those moments. You let them know just by your look and your body language and how assertive you are. Say, hey, listen, thank you for doing this. Now we're going to get some help. Well, what does that mean? I'm not going to therapy. It's okay. You know, let's get in the car. We'll go for a drive somewhere. Well, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, well, got a person coming over to her house. Talk to someone in Christ's hotline. I'm not going anywhere. You just keep your calm. It's like, well, I'm, I'm a little confused because you're telling me that you're suicidal and you want to take your life. Then I'm telling you these things to stop. So sounds like to me, that you're trying to communicate that something's not right inside of you, but maybe it isn't suicide. I don't know. So I want you to talk to someone who can help determine that I'm just your parent. I can support you, but I don't understand what you're going through. Otherwise, I would have already been helping you. Taking the role of I'm not the professional, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to have other people come in, it's going to frustrate someone that's actually calling a bluff so, or someone that's actually bluffing. Someone's crying wolf. It's going to frustrate them because that's not the intention of them doing this. Usually when this happens, they break, they say some things, and they start talking about the real problems because that's not really what they need. Every now and then, a parent's wrong, come to find out that they did need more, but the parent didn't pick up on the red flag, so they had to be more direct about it. The parent thinking that this is a false flag or thinking that they're doing it because they just got in trouble... You're, you may be right. They may be telling you this because they just got in trouble. It doesn't mean that they haven't been thinking about it and this just didn't bring it to the surface. You just don't want to guess. You don't want to play professional and you don't want to put your kids' words, what they say coming out of their mouth as like a definite disrespect that they're using suicide to get out of trouble. Because you know what? Part of it may be that and another part of it may have nothing to do with that. You just don't want to take the guess. Okay? That's... That's good recommendation. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> this is, this is something we've already covered, but I just so I love yeah. this. Okay, so these came from a Don't Freak Out event where we're teaching. These are Hebrew questions. Yeah, these are yeah. Hebrew questions. We this answer is, some middle this school is, questions too. This is more. this is one where um, we talked about statements versus questions, <laughs> and this person says. Is it ever, in all caps, appropriate to ask your teens questions? <laughs> that sounds like a Heidi question. That sounds like... Anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> and because I know I gave that uh, information in a very short amount of time, if you listen to every time I talk about it, I say you never start with questions. That's it. Questions are totally fine to answer once you have a really close relationship with someone and there's a good conversation going on because that's what conversation has back and forth. But when you're trying to have a connection or communication with someone who has resistance or has had a history of being in a bad mood or you guys have fought and have gotten in a fight recently, you don't want to start off with questions. Again, you, they don't know your intention. You're not exposing your intention. And in human psychology, we learn that whoever asks the questions is in control. Salespeople, I talked about this the other night, sales have used human psychology research to try to motivate and produce better sales numbers. They found out a long time ago, if you ask the questions, the person is not in control, you're in control. You can guide and direct the narrative. And on top of that, when there is silence, 
the person who breaks the silence loses. So in this situation, when you're dealing with, um, what, what was the? Uh, she just said, is it ever appropriate? Yeah, ever. And you're dealing with trying to make statements with your kids. You have to understand the statements are your safety. Statements gives you the safety that this conversation has some chance to take flight. Start off with questions, you're going to screw it up. Or the chances you screw it up are too, you're not a master at this yet. Start with the statements. Once you realize that they're responding and they're coming and talking to you, then you simply say, hey, you know, I was thinking, would you mind if I ask you a question about this specific thing? Say, can I ask you a question about this thing? They know your intention. They know a question's about to come and then they'll tell you, yeah, go ahead, ask a question. It's so polite. Most people don't ask you permission to ask you a question. So when your teens hear that, I always joke around by, by I always joke around about this, but every time I do this with teens, they always sit up straight and they mature instantly. They're like, yes, you may proceed. Ask a question because <laughs> they feel respected. So yes, you can ask questions, but not until you've made the statements to break the ice. And then when you do ask the questions, ask permission first. It just makes me chuckle because I've been there. I've been there, folks. Um, okay, this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this one because... I think it's always really great to have teenagers' perspective. So this question obviously came from a teenager in the audience, and she says, he or she says, what if my mom always thinks I'm talking back? Such a, because you probably are. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, I think that this is a, this is a great question because we all kind of deal with this. Well, um, to the teenagers that asked that, I hope you get to hear this on our podcast. If your mom's thinking you're always talking back, let's give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not always talking back. Cause that would be, you, that'd be weird conversations. <laughs> right. It's like, come eat the most delicious dinner that you've ever had. And you love it when I cook this. And then you'd say, why do you want me to eat a delicious dinner? <laughs> That's just not going to happen all the time. Okay. So let's give you the benefit of the doubt that you're not always talking back. Your mom is trying to tell you what to not do, but she's only focusing on what she doesn't like you to do. So she's telling you that she feels that you're being disrespectful, but instead of telling you how to be respectful, she's just telling you to stop being disrespectful and why are you always talking back. There's no solution. She's not helping you. She's not teaching you a course on how to do that. So this is what you do. You go to her and say, not when there's an argument, this is very key. There has to not be drama going on. You go to her and say, you know, mom, I've been thinking a lot about something and you might want to sit down and hold on to your pants because you may be pleasantly surprised when you hear me say this. Apparently, you think I talk back a lot to you. And I started thinking about, you've been telling me this for a long time a lot. So I started to think, okay, well, that's the problem. But I never even thought to come to you and say, what would the opposite of not talking back to you look like? Because if I'm talking back to you, that sounds like disrespect. So I get that. But how, like, what do I say to you? Give me an example when I actually didn't talk back and was respectful so that I know what the difference between the two is because they just may not know. They may talk to their friends like that all the time. Their friends talk to each other like that. So they don't think that's That's, that's what they do on TV. That's, oh man, you start watching the drama shows on TV, that's they're disrespectful. And that's just because that creates drama. So that's what you as a teenager can do. Go to her and say, I, you've made it very clear. You don't like it when I talk back. You made it clear that I, you feel I always talk back, but could you help me figure out what it looks like to not talk back and different options for me? Or maybe it's something the moms I communicate to her are saying, right now, I just need you to do this. If you have any complaints or concerns or disagreements with it, can we just talk about it later? Cause I'm just, I'm having a rough day, but you have to establish that ahead of time that when your mom is going to tell you something that you don't like, that she's already told you sometimes, let's talk about it later. I will listen to you and I may even change my mind later. But if you call me out and call me out on it now and talk back to me now, it's going to be an argument and you're going to change my mind when we're arguing. So what if we switch that around for parents? What if you do have a kid that's always talking back? How can you, I mean, turn that around, right? When there's not drama. You have to really come up with what you're even asking them and need them to do. To know you're offended by your kid, really easy. To articulate how they could approach you differently, not as easy. And you can't make it as simple as, you just need to be respectful. You'd be surprised. I've asked a lot of parents when they That's told me hard, that. Yeah. I said, okay, now I want you to do, okay, 
explain to me what your definition of respectful is. And it usually sounds like this. Uh, just, you know, like not rolling your eyes, like being positive and like just, you know, good energy. I'm like, okay, show me what that looks like. Whoa. They can't even describe it, show a picture of it. So you're telling your kids to do something, but you're not showing them, modeling it for them and talking them through it when there's not a problem. Well, then you have unrealistic expectations. So as a parent, that's your job. You got to go to them when there's not drama, say this problem's happening all the time. To mitigate this problem, let's come up with some pre-planned solutions that I'm going to just take a time out and say, hey, we'll talk about it later. later. Or you'll say, hey, listen, uh, mom, I really don't like what's happening. Can I talk to you about this? You have to have the conversations about here's what we're going to do when the problem happens because it's going to happen. And then if they forget, you can remind them, hey, remember we talked about like we talked about on the side and we wouldn't share our complaints with each other in front of the other kids and stuff. So just give me 30 minutes. Well, you have all my attention if we talk about in the kitchen 30 minutes. They get what they really want, your attention, the opportunity to influence you, and you get what you really want to not create dissension in the troops and cause problems with the other kids where they're going, well, she talks to you like that. Why can't I talk to you like that, mom? Yeah, good suggestion. Um, okay, should I talk to my kids about mistakes I made or rules that I broke as a kid, even with the fear that they could justify their own mistakes? Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Sorry. Say it again. I should have, okay. Should I talk to my kids about mistakes that I made or rules that I broke as a kid? Um, the fear being that maybe they would justify their actions because mom and dad turned out all right. Yeah, right? Okay. I love this question. So I get asked this question a lot. It usually sounds like this. Should I share personal things with them? Because if I do share personal things with them, it's going to give them a justification. I'm going to be a bad example. And they tell me all the things and they answer their own question. So I said, okay, it sounds like you figured it out. They go, no, but I really have a question. Well, you just told me your question is, should I tell them things? And then you just told me all the reasons why you can't. So do you want to know what I think about it? So you say, of course, I want to know. That's why I asked. So, okay, <laughs> here's your options. They either find out about it from you or from your enemies. They either find about it from you or by accident. They either find about it from you or your your skeletons come out of your closet. Something in life. Let's say mom and dad have relationships problems and mom wants to tell kid about all the stuff she couldn't tell them when they were little because it was too inappropriate. You want to control the narrative. And when I say you want to control the narrative means everybody, when you meet someone, if you have dirty laundry, you want to tell them your dirty laundry. You don't want them to find it. So those are your choices. Do you want to be the person to tell them or do you want someone else to be? I'm going with the first one. I want to tell my kids. But how do you go about telling them? Well, here's how I suggest to go about telling them. You don't want to just randomly say, hey, we need to have a family home evening and sit down and talk. Well, 1997, I was arrested for a charge that was may or may not have been my fault. Like, you don't want, it, it's just too much information. Instead, when there's a problem that's not happening, like between the two of you, let's say they have a friend who gets in trouble. You look at him and say, you know what? I'll be honest with you. What your friend did, I'm glad you didn't do that. I'm glad that it's not something you participate in. However, I actually feel bad for your friend. Wait, you feel bad for my friend? Yeah, I feel bad for your friend. Because, you know, when you're younger and I, I didn't feel the need or feel comfortable telling this stuff, but I've made similar choices like that. I got in trouble, learned some really hard lessons. And so one part of me, the parent part of me is like, well, gosh, they shouldn't have done that. And the other part of me, the, just the human part of me that I used to be a teenager too, is like, I could see how they got themselves in that situation. I feel bad for them because I know how bad it feels to ruin your reputation, have, you know, disappoint people. And so I just want to make sure that you know that even though I don't appreciate or I don't condone what they did, I don't think they're a horrible person because of it either. Everybody has a chance to come back. Now, look how vague that was. You're introducing a language of, I've had made mistakes. I have had problems. But the best thing that you're doing is you're saying it in a way that sparks your kid's curiosity. Then they go, oh, I wonder what my parent did. 
I wonder what they're talking about. So now what they have to do to get that information with you, they have to form a relationship. It's a bait and switch. <laughs> you want your kids to know what you really think about stuff through your adult eyes, not through your parenting trying to be perfect eyes. You slowly introduce comments and statements like that. They'll spark their curiosity and then they'll start asking you questions about your past. As they start to ask you questions about your past, then you can pick and choose based upon their age, their where they're at, how much you want to share and let them know, hey, listen, I'm an open book. I'm willing to share everything with you. I'm just a little cautious to, to share too much right now because here's the fact of the matter. It's a long story. There's a lot behind it. But I will tell you, yes, I drank alcohol before. Yes, I've made some choices and decisions before. And I don't do those things now. And I'm whatever it is. I mean, it could be alcohol, it could be you stole something. I don't know, right? Um, for now I've learned some different things, but I want to be honest with you. And yes, I have. See what I did right there is you acknowledge truth that you have, but you don't get into the details because that's when you get yourself in trouble. The details have to come organically over time, not like some parents are like, well, I went through this and when I was when I was 12, I was doing cocaine and when I was 13, I was like, whoa, whoa, too much information, dad. <laughs> like what the heck's going on? You know, way too much. And then the other parent that says, well, you know, I did get arrested once, but you got to understand. So what happened was my situation was totally different than your situation because my situation is I had a rough childhood. Nobody cares. Too much information. Just quietly and calmly go, yeah. I made some bad mistakes. Well, what was it? Well, I can tell you it had to do with being being arrested and you know, yeah. Well, we can talk about more later, but trust me when I tell you, I feel for your friend. Hmm. The vagueness sparks curiosity. The curiosity says, hmm, what if my parents aren't who I thought they were and now they're motivated to try to get more information from you and then you get to pick and choose how much you want to share. Interesting. Okay, this question kind of goes along the same line. It's probably our last question. Um, so it says, how should, okay, should, how, when do I talk to my kids about my own depression, my childhood trauma, or about our family history of depression? I always like that conversations are governed by opportunity. So there's a good chance that your kids are going to come to you and share with you information about other people's struggles to see how you handle those struggles. It's really a test to see, are you going to be the parent that freaks out? Or are you going to be the parent that I can actually open up and talk to about this stuff? So if you've had depression, childhood traumas, all these different types of things, when a conversation comes up, it could be on a celebrity. It could have been like, wow, the celebrity came out and shared that she was abused and you know, that she was taken advantage of, you know, maybe it was a music producer or whatever it may be, or a movie producer. And then you sit there and you, you want to just measure what you say a little bit. You're watching your kid to see where their stand is. Cause you know, teenagers specifically, they're like, that's wrong. That's horrible. You know, this person had an injustice happen to them and blah, and we need to fight for this. And if it's something that you've went through yourself, you could look at them and say, you know, what? you're right. I'm so proud of you that you have passion to try to stand up for people who don't have a voice. And, you know, I'm really proud of you that you uh, feel so passionately, so strongly about things. And I can tell you from someone who personally has gone through some of those things, I appreciate someone standing up for me. And I'm sure your friend, when she hears or finds out that you've been standing up for her and you don't like the way that she's been treated she'll be happy to call you her friend too. That's a perfect introduction because guess what your kid's going to walk away and go, wait, 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 what did you, you, what? what? That's going to check, catch their attention. You got to remember you guys, these are the same kids that look at a text and when it says red and the person has not responded, <laughs> they're like, oh, I'm going to fill in my own blanks. Well, it goes the opposite way too. For sure. When you just do a light little from someone who's also struggled with similar things, they're like, what? Huh? What's going on? All of a sudden, you subtly have their attention. If you tell them, you know, I showed depression, I went through this, but here's what happened. No, they just want to be entertained and they want to be curious. Don't give them too much. Slow bits and pieces. So that one is kind of a, a spinoff of the other one. You have to use your own knowledge and intuition. 
Who do you want them to learn about hard things from? You or the world? You. Absolutely. So if you're being honest with them about hard things, they'll know that they can trust you. And so anything they learn from the world, they can come back and measure it to what you say. But if they think that you sugarcoat things or you try to pass over that you were arrested or I was depressed and yeah, I was suicidal, but you know, it only lasted for two weeks for me. You know, I can't relate to you. Well, they need to know that your information has so much truth that you're giving it to them slowly. See, when parents have these long stories of why you shouldn't do something, long reasons of why this kid is bad for you to hang out with, and long, long, long detailed information, <laughs> that sounds like you're full of crap. Uh. So instead, when you say, you know what, I've, I've had some similar struggles too, so I feel bad for them. That is so simple and so short, they're left with nothing else but to wonder and to want to know more. I'm definitely a long ex explanationer. <laughs> Most parents I'll let you probably are. Know. <laughs> Most parents are. They're either the long explanationer or they say nothing and they give you the solid concrete look of shame. Yeah. Well, those are some really good questions. Real quick, were all those questions from Heber? No, the, the last two. Okay, were good. From just want to make sure school. we had. So, yeah. people from the middle school will also answer some more questions next week as well. We just had some questions from our Heber event. So, yeah. Yeah. And thank you for the questions, guys. Yeah. I, you know, it's always interesting to me to hear you just spout out. Because I'll read the question. I'll be like, I have no idea. <laughs> That's It's really one of your gifts that you can just, just come talk up. trash without an ending point. Yes, that is <laughs> one of my gifts. No, I just, any of my friends are listening to this. Wish, they're like, you have no idea how long he can talk for. I just wish that I could just insert that knowledge and in, like somehow – plug in those responses so that I don't give a freak out. So I don't have to backpedal because- so They have to apologize you know. and get back to square one. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, but you know what, you guys, you're here listening and you're curious and you're open and you're learning and that is huge. And the more that you don't freak out and the more that you make statements and the more that you- Go first. Give the benefit of the doubt. Play the naive card. The more that you spark curiosity, you will be building relationships instead of destroying them. You know, because those, <laughs> those are two choices, right? Um, so we're glad that you're here and we appreciate um, your recommendations that go out to your friends and your sisters and your loved ones and your your the people you work with and um, the lady that you're sitting next to on the airplane. Um, your comments, your, you know, your feedback on iTunes about our podcast, all that. Yeah. We, we appreciate it. And we hope to meet all of you guys someday. I would love it if at some point I got a chance to shake hands, give a hug and say hi to every single listener. So. Yeah. Really cool. So um, thank you for answering those questions, David. Thank you for serving up on a hot plate. And, th <laughs> and thank you for putting yourself out there um, with your TED Talk. And we're excited to see the instant replay. <laughs> Not so instant of a replay. Yeah. Six to eight weeks. That's <laughs> too fast of a replay. Um, but as always, we want to thank you listeners for helping us to light the fight.